If you are able, please remain standing for the today's scripture lesson, which comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. Hear the word of God. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to them, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all this morning? The, uh, I got here this morning and I'm, str- <laughs> I'm glad to be here first off. And we have, we've been on a long journey. I feel like we've been in the car a long time with the Are We There Yet series. And uh, Chris and I actually switched weeks. He was supposed to have this week and I was supposed to have last week. And uh, we kept topics. So I noticed last week at the beginning of his, he said, man, we've been in the car a long time and all this. And I thought this morning it hit me. I went, oh. He was, scheduled, he was set up to say that at the end of this whole thing, like, like, let's get out of the car. I'm tired of this. So I'm glad to be here. We've had some really unique topics. And Chris called me, I don't know, a few months back and said, Randy, would you be willing to speak on this topic? Siblings fighting and other problems in the church. <laughs> I'm an idiot. I invoked my 24-hour rule that I sometimes try to invoke with my kids that when we have a problem, we don't talk for 24 hours, at least not about the problem. Uh, so I invoked my 24-hour rule, and I took 24 hours to think about it and called him back and said, I can do that. I, was, I got a brother. I got kids, siblings fighting. I got this. No problem. Problems in the church. Okay. It was, I've struggled with this. I want you all to know I've prayed about this all week, and I've struggled with it. And my wife can tell you, I had pages thrown all across our kitchen table and everything, trying to figure out how to put this together. And then I get here this morning, and through our response and the first hymn that I hear, Taylor and I haven't talked at all, except all these guys knew was the scripture for the day. I get here, and I hear the first response, and I hear the first hymn, and I go, I don't need to talk. Taylor just did it for me <laughs> in that response. I keep hearing key words like, unity, uh, conflict, love one another, and all that. So you're going to hear some of what you heard in the response in my sermon. Uh, When I think of this car trip that we're on, are we there yet? I think of kids. And for me, it was me and my brother, but I've got three kids. So I said, you know, so there's three kids in the back seat. And one of them's back there yelling, Mom, he's looking at me. Make him stop. And the other one's sitting there going, He's touching me, he's touching me. And the other one's sitting there not really touching him, going, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, and all that. And that's, that's kind of what I picture in all of this. It's, uh, uh, I, figure, I picture this crazy car trip that we're on. Uh, the, uh, I believe as parents, we've all had this conversation with our kids at one point or another. My kids went through a phase of picking on each other. Well, Mason got picked on. Drew and Trey did the picking, I guess. Uh, Which he was a pest. Sometimes he deserved it. I'm glad to say they they grew out of it. But uh, we went through a phase where they uh, picked on each other terribly. And uh, I had this conversation with them that I'm sure every parent's had with their kids at some point in time. When we were headed down to uh, Friends, every year we get together. I think I've told you all this before. We go to, every New Year's, we go to Mark and Jane's house and get together with old old friends that we've had through church. And... um, I can remember one of the topics once before was looking at them and going, whatever you do, don't embarrass me. (laughs) We've all said it to our kids. We're going down there. Don't you act down there like you do at home. I'm not putting up with it. We've all all done that. We've all done that with our kids. uh, I remember one time when you think about siblings, rivalries, and stuff like that, My kids are angels compared to the siblings in the Bible. Uh, I started looking at sibling rivalries in the Bible, and the first four you come across and all that, and we're going to talk about them a little bit in a minute, but uh, my kids are angels compared to that, except for that one moment I can remember in our living room back in that picking on phase when uh, Drew was sitting on the couch and Mason was sitting on the love seat, and 
Drew's mocking Mason, and out of nowhere, which Mason probably was, he had his ways. I'm not saying he, no one deserves being picked on, let's say it that way, but Drew was picking on him, and Mason, all of a sudden, I'm in the chair, Mason jumps up and leaps from one couch to the other and pounces on him. And I really thought he was going to kill him. I thought he was about to take his head off. And I reached over real quick, jumped up and grabbed him and pulled him off and all that. And it's just one of those crazy moments. That one reminds me of the rivalries in the Bible. Because there's some crazy rivalries we're going to talk about. Uh, when, uh, uh, when you think about sibling rivalries in the Bible, we think about Cain and Abel. They were the first two born of Adam and Eve. Uh, Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. And so these two uh, go to make sacrifices to God. Uh, Cain, some of his crop, and Abel, some of his livestock. And God found favor with Abel's livestock offering more than he did with Cain's offering. And so the reason kind of goes that Abel brought his best. He brought his first and his best when it came to his livestock. And Cain maybe didn't with his crop. And so God favored Abel. Cain didn't like it. Cain was filled with jealousy, sinful jealousy. And Cain lured Abel into the field and killed him. That's a sibling rivalry. Like I said, my kids are angels compared to some of these. The... Uh, then there's Joseph, Joseph and his brothers. Everybody knows this story about Joseph and his brothers. Uh, Joseph's dad favored him over his brothers. He uh, gave him even an ornamental robe in there. And uh, the brothers decided, we'll kill him. We'll murder him. It's all about this murder with siblings in the Bible. I don't get this in the early verses. So they decided, we'll kill him. So they took him out. And then they uh, kind of changed their mind and said, no, we shouldn't kill him. But they sold him into slavery. And uh, uh, they didn't see him for years, and through, uh, but through a lot of hard times, and uh, there was a famine involved. And uh, as the story goes, they go, go to get uh, help from one of the kingdoms there, and it turns out that's where he's at. That's where Joseph is at. And uh, uh, he's not innocent in this whole thing either. I kind of think of him as, as being the taunter a little bit too in all of this, uh, in this rivalry so early on. Uh, but then he plays with them a little bit, and, uh, but eventually they all reconcile in the end in that one. And then there's the prodigal son. We think about the prodigal son. Of course, there was a father who had two sons, and the youngest went to him and said, Dad, give me what portion of yours is mine. And he takes it and takes off with it and goes out and basically squanders it, as the Bible tells us, and spends it all. And then when he doesn't have anything left, he goes home. He says, I'm, uh, you know, why don't I just, you know. My dad's servants are better than I am. Why don't I just go home? So he goes home. The father sees him come and welcomes him with open arms, kills the fatted calf. They celebrate. And the, uh, the older son goes, wait a minute. I didn't get all this. I never got this celebration. What's up with this? And so again, we kind of go, ah, oh, this is crazy. So he's mad at his father. His father looks at him and says, you've had everything I've had all along. Everything I have is at your disposal. So in these, we, we learn a few things from these three, and then I'm going to hit one more. We learn a few things. We learn in uh, like Cain and Abel that we all bring different things to the table. We all bring different things to God. We all bring different things to our lives. But God does want us to honor one another. In Joseph and his brothers, we understand that it takes two to have a rivalry. And you can't just have it by yourself. That it takes two. We're all got a part in this. In the prodigal son, we learn that we need to show unconditional love and not always be so concerned about ourselves. And then there's this one that hit me because it kind of hit me close to home. I see myself in this one. Some, it's kind of crazy because it's hard to see yourself in these. Jacob and Esau. So they were, I think, the first twins of the Bible. And they struggled in the womb before they were ever born. You know, when they came out, I think Jacob had hold of Esau's heel. It's almost like a fight to see who was getting out first and all this. And so Esau was a, a skillful hunter. He was a man of the open country. He was his father's favorite. We're back to this favorite thing. Parents also play a part in sibling rivalries at times. We're not, we're not, at, uh, uh, we're not innocent in this whole thing either sometimes. But uh, 
He was his father's favorite. Jacob was a quiet man. One of the commentaries I read said he liked hanging around the tents. What that means? He was his mother's favorite. And uh, Esau came home one day from uh, hunting and uh, was hungry. And said, oh, I'm famished. I'm going to die if I don't get something to eat. And Jacob was cooking some stew. And Esau comes in and says, uh, uh, man, let me, let me have some of your stew. And Jacob, being very smart and cunning, said, hmm. I'll give you some stew if you'll give me your birthright. So birthright, there's a difference because he also, we'll talk about his blessing in a minute. Birthright was where the oldest son got double portion of the inheritance. So he would get like two-thirds, the younger son would get a third. So he tells him, I'll give you some stew if you'll sell me your birthright. So Esau does that. So Esau gets duped and he sells him his uh, birthright. Then after that... Uh, Jacob and his mom come up with the idea to deceive their father and not only steal the birthright, but to also get the blessing. So the whole story goes that uh, she dresses him up, puts some fur skins on his hands. The father had told Esau, his older son, to go out and kill something and, and make him some uh, food, his favorite food. And uh, the mom heard this and said, uh, wow, this is an opportunity. He said, when you come back, I'll give you a blessing. Mom said, this is an opportunity. So she took Jacob, uh, put some fur skins, because Esau was a very manly man, you know, and put some fur skins on his hands and, and uh, went and made the favorite dish and sent him in there. And the father was poor of sight at that time. And so they, he said, are you, are you Esau? And he said, yes, I am. And uh, so he goes on to bless Jacob. So not only did Jacob take his birthright from Esau. He also took his blessing from his father. And so again, in this one, Esau wanted to kill his brother. So Jacob heard this and he fled. So, so that's a crazy story to say. So where do I see myself in that story? Uh, I was a mama's boy. I was, I, I don't know that I was my mom's favorite, but I was a mama's boy. Seems like every time we had an argument in the house, it was me and my mom and my dad and my brother Mike on the other side. And that's terrible to say, but that's kind of where it was. Um, just a quick story. Stacey will go, oh my God, he's going off script. So my parents were, uh, my, were married at an older age. My, it was my dad's second marriage. He was 50. My mom was in her mid-30s. And uh, they didn't think they could have kids. So they adopted my brother Mike. And as every adoption goes, once you adopt a child, what happens? You get pregnant. That's what happens. I don't know how that works. So they adopted Mike, and then they got pregnant, and I was born. Uh, he's two years older than me. Uh, Mike and I are really different. We argued a lot as kids and stuff and had, I guess, typical fights and all that. And um, I remember one time, and I apologized for it and, and uh, apologized to him for it later and apologized for a lot of things. Uh, I swung a belt. You ever seen the old brass belt buckles and the leather belts? I swung a belt one time with a brass belt buckle and hit him in the head. And the reason I know I'm a mama's boy, because as soon as I did that, I had him pinned in the closet. Remember, he was older than me. I had no advantage. I swung, hit him in the head. As soon as I hit him in the head, I went, oh, no, that's not good. And I took off running and got behind mama and going, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. That's how I know I was a mama's boy. Uh, Mike and I were really different. I said some hurtful things to Mike as a child, knowing he was adopted. We knew he was adopted. It was open in our house and everything. And I said some hurtful, hurtful things to him that I probably didn't realize how hurtful they could be until later on in life. And um, we had the opportunity later on in life to talk about He's, he, he wasn't innocent in it either. He did some things, too, that disrupted our, our family and, and uh, tore us apart a little bit. Um, but we had a chance to talk about it. I had a chance to ask him about some of the things he did, and he apologized, and I apologized for some of the things I did. And, um, so, it, you know, words can be very hurtful. Um, I've told my sons this, uh, this story, and I, I, picture, I picture it as kind of like a braided rope. And that braided rope, when I say something to them, if I say something hurtful to my sons or I say something hurtful to my brother, I feel like one of the braids in that rope breaks and you can't put it back. You can't put it back together. You can tie it in a knot. So there might be a scar right there, but you can never put it back. So I always feel like when we say hurtful things, that some, some part of that relationship gets clipped a little. And so keep that in mind when we're talking and when, when your words come out. 
it's, uh, it's hard um, and it's regretful at times. Um, another person I, I know of said to me once that uh, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube uh, in that. So um, remember that as you're, as you're talking to your kids and your siblings and everything. Um, but in all these stories, God's will still prevails. I wasn't close to my brother. I said that. I wasn't close to him. We never had that brotherly relationship uh, that I see my three sons developing. My three sons, I love them to death. They, well, gosh, we went through a lot as kids with them. Uh, it's funny to watch them now because they're close. They're really close. Uh, Trey did make the comment as we were talking about this topic a little bit. Trey made the comment that uh, he did take up for Mason one time when the neighbor child was picking on him. I said, you did? He said, yeah. I told him he couldn't do that. Stop picking on my brother. I said, oh, that's pretty good. He goes, yeah, if anybody's going to pick on him, it's going to be me. So, so Trey did take up for him once. Uh, I wasn't close to my brother, but I found brotherly affection as I grew up. Uh, Eddie Landreth was an older gentleman that uh, was like a brother to me. Jay Farr, uh, that gave me rides to school and stuff, was like a brother to me. The folks that I met at Wilmington Island I, that I talked about in my last talk, folks that came into my life at Wilmington Island United Methodist Church and Jones Memorial and even here at Ringgold United Methodist Church, some of y'all are sitting out here today, have become brothers to me. And so we are God's family. God brings us together. We know that really good when we read Matthew 12, 46 through 50. It says, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside wanting to speak to him. And someone actually told him, said, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to talk to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. We as believers are part of God's family. We each come into this family with very, as very unique individuals. We bring different personalities, different ideas, different likes and dislikes, different gifts and talents to this family of Christ. So just like in our crazy families, these crazy arguments we have in our families, there's bound to be crazy arguments in the church. A gentleman put an online survey out there asking about conflicts in the church. And he came up with some, and I'm not going to read them all because there was 25 of them, but some of them I picked out. Some of them hit close to home, I left those out. I left out the ones that... I read that one and went, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm going to leave that one out. Uh, he says, one church had a heated 45-minute argument over the type of filing cabinet to purchase. Black or brown, two-drawer, three-drawer, four-drawer. said, a big church argued over the discovery that the church budget was off by 10 cents. That's terrible, isn't it? said, so they finally settled the argument. Somebody coughed up a dime. One church argued over what type of green beans the church should serve. Now, wait a minute now, because some green beans can be waxy. I mean, you know, so that's, you know. His comment in the back of that one was, I got an answer, none. Um, he said, two different churches reported fights over the type of coffee. In one of the churches, they moved from Folgers to a stronger Starbucks brand. In the other church, they simply moved to a stronger blend. That comment after that one said some people left the church over that, over coffee. Uh, here's one. It's close to home with the youth since I kind of hang out with the youth. Some major conflict when the youth borrowed a crock pot that had not been used for years. Those pesky youth. Uh, a church member was chastised because she brought vanilla syrup to the coffee cart. It looked too much like liquor. We can find something to put it in. I mean, there's, there's some answers here. Some church members left the church because one church member... All right, this is just childish. This is what... I, some church members left the church because one church member hid the vacuum cleaner from them. <laughs> Resulted in a major fight and split. These are comments that came back on this guy's survey from, from uh, incidents that people knew and all this. It's crazy, isn't it? These are, these are silly issues and many are absurd. But what they are is distractions. They're distractions from what we should be doing in our churches. In that sense, they're also really great distraction 
from God's great commission and for the plans that he has for us. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for his disciples and then he prayed for his believers. He said this, I've given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. There's that word, unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. For unity, we have to be mutually respectful and mutually willing to give and to surrender. Chris talked about it a couple of weeks ago in spiritual practices that we don't like to practice, in the submission and the surrender part of it. It's not about submission or surrendering to each other or to the other part of the argument, if that's what we're talking about. It's about surrendering to God and giving up our life to him. How can we know the will of God for our lives and then for his church if we don't submit to and trust in his plans and calling for our lives? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. When God is controlling our actions and our attitudes, we can be assured that there will be unity among the body of Christ. Psalm 133 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live in unity. We achieve such unity when we seek to know and understand God's will for our lives and his church. Henry and Richard Blackaby wrote a study called Experiencing God. Doing, let's see, Experiencing God, Knowing and Doing the Will of God. And in this study, they wrote several things. And I'm going to read a little bit of what, of what they said. It says here, Within the heart of every Christian is the innate desire to know and to do his will. Fortunately, God has assigned the Holy Spirit to be your teacher. You can't come to know God in your own wisdom. The Holy Spirit points you toward the Father and toward the Lord Jesus. He opens your mind and he opens your heart to him. When your life starts to become God-oriented, you see that God has an agenda that we knew nothing about. He has a mission. They go on to say the more you experience God, the more you come to know him. Throughout scripture, scripture they say a common practice comes, comes up that they see. They call it the seven realities for experiencing God. One of those realities tells us, there's several of them, one of them, I pulled several of them out because there's one that we're talking about here when we talk about God speaks to us. But there's several in there. One of them is that God is always at work around us. The study is about finding out where God's at work and joining him where he's at. That sometimes it's not as hard as we make it. But number, uh, number four in that series says that God, uh, God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purpose, and his ways. So God speaks to us through spiritual practices. This is a lot about what Chris talked about the other day. When we talk about Bible, studying the Bible, when we talk about our prayer time, when we talk about uh, circumstances, people in the church, we hear it from other folks in the church. God will speak to us through the Holy Spirit, through all of these avenues to actually reveal himself to us. I'm going to Go off script. I read a tweet this morning. I told Britta I was going to do this. I don't think Kevin's here. Uh, Kevin Alton tweeted back to a, a girl made a comment. One of the girls that he follows made a comment about, and it was unique. It was crazy because we've been talking about spiritual practices, and it said, uh, wh uh, what is your favorite spiritual practice right now? This was a random tweet on his page, and uh, uh, Kevin Alton answered back, and he said, silence. And he said, not, not for the quietness of it, but for the listening in it. And I thought that was so prophetic in the sense that God will speak to us if we just stop sometimes and listen. And maybe that's just in the quietness of it all. Through study, prayer, circumstances, through the spiritual practices that Chris spoke of and through the church, other believers, God does speak to us. 
Blackaby writes, You grow in unity with the body of Christ as you surrender yourself to God and seek his will. As his Holy Spirit enters your life and begins to make you into the man or woman that he would have you to be. I wanted to end with a a, a kind of a challenge for us. Four points that I came across that I thought is what God's telling us and how God is telling us to live. He says to us, let us love one another for love comes from God. Let us be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Let us serve one another. It says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And we should pray for one another. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Love one another, be compassionate and kind to one another, serve one another, and pray for one another. That's just four things. If we could do those, what unity and what love we would have for each other, what what love God would see in us and how others would see us. The, the, The thing about a church is people are looking, right? The outside folks that see us look at us and think, ah, oh, those, those folks are from over there. The way we act is important. And the way we love one each other and love one another and take care of each other is so important. Romans 12, 5 through 10, and I'm going to pull my glasses out for this one because I've got some smaller script here. It says that my glasses are fogged. It says... Romans 12, I found this, and and it's actually at the bottom of this, it's hilarious. It says, Ringgold United Methodist Church is a community of believers inspired to develop, support, and share active relationships with Jesus Christ. So as I was looking for uh, thoughts and scriptures and stuff, I came across this one, and it must have come off of our page. Isn't that great? It says, Ringgold United Methodist Church, making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We get in the way of that a lot of times. The silly arguments and the silly disagreements and the stuff that we try and decide and all that. Some of that's got to be decided, but we get in the way a lot of times. Romans 12, 5 through 10 out of the Good News Bible says this. In the same way, though we are many, we are one body in union with Christ. We are all joined to each other as different parts of one body. So we are to use our different gifts in accordance with the grace that God has given us. If our gift is to speak God's message, we should do it according to the faith that we have. If it is to serve, we should serve. If it is to teach, we should teach. If it is to encourage others, we should do so. Whoever shares with others should do it generously. Whoever has authority should work hard. Whoever shows kindness to others should do it cheerfully. Love must be completely sincere. Hate what is evil. Hold on to what is good. Love one another warmly as Christian brothers and sisters. And be eager to show respect for one another. Let's close with a word of prayer this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, We thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the hard topics that we try and get through. We thank you, Lord, for being with us always. Lord, we pray that as brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, that we would would seek to do your will in our lives. And that as we seek to do your will in our lives, Lord, that we would seek your will for our church. We pray, Lord, that you would love on us like you always have and that we would be able to pass that love on to others. Lord, we ask that you continue to bless us as you always do. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen.